Welcome once again to our presentation. And uh, we are in number eight in this series of the prophets, but number two in uh, should E.G. White materials be used as a test of fellowship. And so I want to welcome us in this presentation and uh, I hope that uh, we shall be blessed together. Let us pray. Again, our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the weather that you have given unto us, even the rains that are still pouring down. We pray that uh, they may recede and uh, we may be able to use these feeble instruments to be able to pass the message you have given unto us today. And Lord, may you use my lips. And Lord, help your children and your church to continue growing in the full stature of the man Jesus Christ. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so in the number seven, which was the introductory part, should E.G. White materials be used as a test of fellowship? We used ex we looked uh, extensively at the, the materials that um, were in Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald. And uh, we were per se looking at what uh, James White had spoken about the issue. Today we want just uh, on this uh, presentation to proceed where we left. And if you didn't watch the presentation number one, I'll urge you to go back and look at that presentation where in uh, summary, we saw that uh, those who are coming are uh, new in faith, the news be the newbies in faith, they cannot be tested with the visions and the work they have not seen or gone through. And so uh, we saw that uh, they cannot be tested by them, but those who have been in the faith for long and have been able to be acquainted with the materials of E.G. White, they need to be dealt with if um, they rise against the material and start spreading misinformation about um uh, uh, the writings of Miss White. Also, we saw one thing that um, uh, we saw one thing that those who are coming newly in faith should be uh, told that uh, really the church has uh, a messenger of the Lord, so that uh, they may not let uh, say that they have been introduced into what they didn't know and baptized into what they don't know, and so they need to be told even though uh, they are not being baptized into her writings, that uh, we believe in the fruitage of uh, the spirits, the, 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 um, the fruits of the spirit, and this um, uh, gift of the spirit have been manifested in the church. And so we want to continue from uh, where we left, and uh, we. I want to go now to other statements. And this one, I'll start with the statement of uh, G.I. Butler. Uh, this is written uh, in the fruitage of uh, Spiritual Gifts, page 62, paragraph 3. And uh, this is Christian Lewis reporting what uh, the General Conference, bullet, uh, General Conference President G.I. Butler had uh, wrote on the subject. And... Uh, he says, as we continue in this series, the prophets, and this is, uh, should Egypt materials be used as a test of uh, fellowship? We believe these visions because the Bible teaches them. We use the rules given in that holy book and are forced to the conclusion that these manifestations are the work of the Spirit of God. Instead of our setting up these visions above, and outside of the scriptures as another rule of authority, our opponents pretend we claim that none can really take the Bible and fairly apply its teachings without accepting these visions as from God. The Bible is the supreme authority in deciding this as well as other questions. When it tells us to try the spirits, 
to prove all things and hold fast that which is good, it is our duty to do this. We find by so doing that these visions harmonize perfectly with the scriptures. Written in Review and Herald, June 9, 1874. Now, uh, Lewis Christian, in the footage of the spiritual gifts, page 62, paragraph 4, says, the relation of the spirit of, pro of prophecy to the Holy Scriptures is not a theory but a long and blessed experience with Adventists. The testimonies never lead away from the Bible. We are known as a church of Bible students. It is a matter of record that our foreign missionaries sell and use more Bibles than do the missionaries of any other church. We do not understand that the gifts spoken of in the Scriptures were in any way to supersede the Bible. The work and the office of the Spirit of God in the church, that is, the manifestation of spiritual gifts, does not do away with the Word of God. The gifts lead to the Word and build on the Word. We believe, however, that the Scriptures teach that the gifts of the Spirit were not merely for the apostolic church, but were to be found among God's people to the end of time, and especially in the remnant church at the close of time. These gifts are not given primarily for sinners. They are bestowed upon the church to build up, preserve and guide the people of the Lord. This brings us to the important question, how and by what means are the spiritual gifts to be tested? Some time ago, in the course of a meeting, I met a prominent doctor and scientist who claimed that the prophetic gift should be tested by medical science. Yet, in his lecturer that day, the doctor stated that medical science was constantly expanding and that medical books 10 years old could not be considered liable, in fact, must be given up. When I called this attention to that, he admitted that, of course, medical science, which is constantly growing, developing, and even changing so that um, new textbooks must be written every 10 years, could not possibly be the test for a divine gift. There have been those who claim that the prophetic gift should be tested by the known facts of history. That position, however, is most unsound. All we know of history is what we find written in books or letters, in stone inscriptions, in uh, government decrees or laws, and in literature generally. But no one ever wrote everything that happened, and no one ever read everything that was written. Further, no two thinkers on, his, on history draw exactly the same conclusion from what they read. The plain truth is that it takes as much inspiration to write perfect history as perfect prophecy. And anyway, no divine gift could be correctly tested by the fallible human knowledge of history. Now, that is something because uh, there is an evolution of everything in this world, apart from the Bible, which is not evolving in any way. I think the best statement was the statement by... Uh, James White, who said, once we take the spiritual gifts to take the place of the Bible, then the Bible will be subject to the gifts and not the gifts to the Bible. And one of um, the saddest things that you'll ever find the church doing is to put the gifts before the Bible. The Bible should be put before the gifts and every gift should be tested on that. And that is why I say that um, most Sunday keeping brethren, they have put the gift before the Bible in that uh, they believe in the gift of tongue. And if there is a church that does not have the gift of tongues, then it's not the church of God. Some believe so much in the gift of the miracles that if your church has no one who is working miracles, then it's no church. The gifts have replaced the church and in doing that, they have put man where the Holy Spirit should be or where God should be. The gifts have been esteemed more than the word of God and the giver of that word. In fact, God has to agree with the gifts instead of the church agreeing with God. That is why they trump against the law of God because they follow the men who purport to have the gifts instead of following the Bible and measuring the man with the uh, with the Bible. And so uh, this is the same case that uh, science cannot be used to prove 
the gift. This question of testing the prophetic gifts of Ms. White is not a new one. The, near, the early pioneers and veterans in the Adventist church, including James White, the first outstanding leader, invited every sincere seek after truth to make a thorough investigation of this gift. They never made faith in the writings of Ms. White, a test of church fellowship. Miss White herself said that this should not be done, and she willingly invited people to test the vision, saying that all should decide from the weight of evidence. In the Testimonies, Volume 3, page 255, paragraph 1. She made the claim with, with deep conviction that her revelations were visions from God and compared her teachings to that of ancient prophets. She said, In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In, this last, in these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more honestly than he instructed them now concerning his will and the course that he will have them pursue. And this was Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 661. Miss White's position was that no one could be consistent and say that although her books were informative and spiritually edifying, they were no different from books of Luther, Spurgeon, or other godly authors. She claimed that her messages were of supernatural origin, that is, given in a vision. In Testimonies, Volume 5, page 671, she said, God, God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs, and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This work is of God, or it's not. God does, not, God does nothing in part partnership with Satan. My work bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway mark in the matter. The testimonies are of the spirit of God or of the devil. Now, in the footage of the spiritual gift, LH, that is Lewis Christian, says that this positive claim by Miss White was the only one possible. It's, it's self-evident when we remember her condition of body and mind during the visions in which she saw or heard the things she wrote. Back in those years, it was generally granted by all who knew her that it could not be otherwise. Many years before he died, J.N. Loboro, a man of keen mind, wrote, I have seen Sister White in vision about 50 times. The first one I saw her have was at the close of a meeting when she was well enough to take a long journey. Her last open vision was in 1884 on the campground at Portland, Oregon, Oregon, she has visions at the present time, but they are not open visions in a public assembly. It is a heavenly place to be in where there is an open vision, as some of those here who have seen her at such a time can testify. The first indication that she is about to be taken off in a vision is that she loses all her strength, like a person suddenly falling down. This state continues not more than five seconds when she suddenly rises to her feet. She herself said that the first thing she knows, an angel stands by her side and touches her and she receives strength. This is just as it was with Daniel. She has been examined while in vision by skillful physicians and we have testimonials from them which declare that the phenomena of her vision are beyond their comprehension. A remarkable evidence of the superhuman strength which Sister White has while in vision was given during her third vision. When she held on her arm a, large, a Bible 18 inches long, 11 inches wide and 4 inches thick and weighing 18 and 4 pounds. It was published by Joseph Seal of Boston, Mass. in 1822. This is uh, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, I presume. This she held out at arm's length, her eyes meanwhile looking straight up, and her mind and her hand turning from text to text for more than half an hour, pointing to the text with her finger and operating, repeating them. I have conversed with those who examined every text as she pointed to them and they testified that she repeated everyone correctly. This was an indication that the power of God was connected with that work. At uh, another time, Sister White held this same kind of Bible, of a Bible open in one hand, above her head at an angle of 45 degrees for half an hour while she turned from text to text and repeated the words to which she pointed. The spectators stood in chairs to examine the text as she pointed to them. Some of them tried to hold a Bible in their hand at this angle and could not do so, but the Bible in her hand seemed to be as firm as if the two had been glued together. General Conference Bulletin, 
1893, pages 19 and pages 20. Another witness writes, as one who has frequently observed her in vision, knowing the company of people usually present, all deeply observant and believers in her exercises, I have often wondered why a more vivid description of the scenes which transpired has not been given. In vision, her eyes were open. In vision, her eyes were open. There were no breath, but there was graceful movements of the shoulders, arms, and hands expressive of what she saw. It was impossible for anyone else to move her hands or arms. She often uttered words singly and sometimes sentences which expressed to those about her the nature of the view she was having either of heaven or earth. Now, this issue, when Sister White was in a vision, there was no breath. It is something uh, really amazing, but not surprising. But why is it amazing? And uh, why is it that it cannot be said, this is the work of Satan? I believe for this one reason, although I have never seen somebody uh, say this, uh, if you are breathless, then you are dead. That, that, that's something that I, I want to conceive, uh, that uh, it, Satan cannot give life, by the way. And uh, if uh, really you are not breathing, and uh, I know some doctors can take a uh, 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 a swipe on me on this one but this is my point Satan cannot do such a phenomena that uh, you don't have a breath and then at the same time you are speaking unless he's playing on the minds of the people and not on the person that one is possible that uh, he can blind all the people who are watching you and make them uh uh, believe that you are not breathing when you are breathing. But then, we, as we shall see, that uh, tests were given and even uh, uh, she was subjected to some uh, pain which she never really uh, felt uh, at all. And so this is a phenomena that I believe that Satan cannot do a miracle on this wise, that he can take away the breath of a person, yet the person be speaking and... Uh, there is something that uh, I, I can just reconcile with the works of the devil other than the work of God. And so, uh, we continue reading that um, this is uh, what uh, we were reading. Sorry. So, in our vision, there was no breath but there was that graceful movement. And then she could utter the words she was having either of heaven. Uh, she could express those things she was seeing, whether of heaven or earth. Her first word in vision was glory, sounding at first close by and then dying away in the distance, seemingly far away. This was some time repeated. There was never an excitement among those present during a vision. Nothing caused fear. It was a solemn, quiet scene, sometimes lasting an hour. When the vision was ended and she lost sight of the heavenly light, as it were, coming back to the earth once more, she would exclaim with a long-drawn sigh as he took her first natural breath, dark with the letters separated. She was then limp and without strength. This was Martha R. Amadon, notebook leaflets, miscellaneous leaflet number two quoted in Ministry, March 1944, page four. When we speak... Um, of uh, Miss White messages as given by inspiration, we wish to stress two points. First, it's well known that she did not employ a stenographer in her work, but she herself wrote by hand most of her many manuscript. Some of these copy books in her original handwriting are still with her, so that quite a bit of what is published under her name can be traced to her own hand. Elder and Miss White exercised the greatest care in sending out the messages. At first, her writings were often read to trust with brethren in the church, and sent out with their recommendations. When some opponents tried to print them without her consent, there was danger that her writings would be changed and falsified. Thus, Miss White inserted a note in our first paper, Present Truth, May 1850, as follows. Ellie Curtis is well known by many of the brethren that 
that Eli Curtis has published many of my visions. He has pursued such an inconsistent course for some time past, and his influence on the course of truth is such at this time that I feel it my it it my duty to say to the brethren that I have no faith in his in his course, and that he has published my visions contrary to my wishes, even after I had requested him not to publish them. About uh, how to understand the writings of E.G. White and the framework of her work, I was able to go through that presentation. And uh, I believe it is uh, number six. You can go through it and you see more about uh, compilations and publication and uh, the scope of framework of her work. The second point is that uh, the printing of Miss White writings has never been a commercial enterprise for gain. In the beginning, they were given away free. In the review of January uh, 22, 1867, we have this note from Elder White, Testament, the church number 11. This work will be ready in a few days. Address Elder James White, Battle Creek, Michigan. We print 2,000 copies which are free to all on the receipt of postage. Those who choose to pay can send 10 cents a copy and postage, which is 2 cents a single copy, or by the quantity 2 cents of 4 ounce. And those who choose can send more than the above price to enable us to offer this testimony without requiring a price. Now, you know, you will maybe hear in the comment that uh, did not E.G. White have royalties upon the work which uh, she did? And this is true, but uh, what was um, the reason why she did this? It was not for monetary cases, but it was to enable the publishing house continue with the work. Like just we'll have people printing the Bibles today and they sell them. Why are they printing the Bible and selling them? Are they selling the word of God? No, they are not selling the word of God, but so that the work may continue going forward. And many people, both who can afford and cannot afford, that it may facilitate them getting these uh, materials. And that is what I believe when it comes to royalties of Sister White materials, that is what she did. In fact, she died in debt, um, uh, just doing the work of God. Right from the beginning of the Advent movement, this subject of testing the prophet's prophetic gift was carefully studied and um, clearly, and clear answers were given as to why we believe Miss White was a messenger sent from the Lord. We will quote here an example of what was written in those early years on that topic. In the official paper of our church, the review of March 31, 1891, we find the following questions and answers. J. M. Van Kirk Rufiven of Iowa asks, does the Seventh-day Adventist church believe the so-called testimonies and writings of Miss White to be revelations from God? Two, if uh, the foregoing question be answered in the affirmative, that is yes, then I inquire, upon what grounds do you accept her writings to be revelations from God? Number three, has Miss E.G. White ever performed any miracle in support of her claims? And you see how the prophetic gift is now tied to the miracles while John the Baptist, Nathan, and David, and other prophets like Samuel never did a miracle. Answer. The Seventh-day Adventist Church regard the testimonies and writings of Sister White as having come through one of the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 1-4 and Ephesians 4, 8 and 11, which were especially set in the church. 1 Corinthians 2, 12, 28 and were to continue to the end. Acts 2, 17-21 Corinthians 1, 6-7 and 7. Among these gifts is the spirit of prophecy, the operation of which is to bring a person fully under the influence of the Holy Spirit that to such a person are given through open vision, 1 Samuel 3, 1, or some equivalent operation, use of the spiritual world, revelations of the spiritual condition of the church or individuals of present and future dangers and duties, and of things to come, John 16, 13. This feature of the gifts, if we, are rightly if we rightly apprehend certain prophecies, was to become especially prominent in the days which immediately precede the second advent of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 4, and 19 to 23, Revelation 12 to 17, and 19 to 10. When one meets some manifestation of this kind, which he believes to be a genuine operation of the Spirit of God, we leave anyone to judge how far he must receive what comes in this manner to be a revelation from God. Number two, 
The second question is quite fully answered in the foregoing. We believe the writings of Sister White to be a revelation from God because we believe them to be one of the gifts above referred to. And we believe them to be one of the gifts because they bear all the marks and characteristics which are set forth in the scripture by which a work of this kind is shown to be genuine. When Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20 says, quench not the spirit and despise not prophesying, he adds, prove all things that is test all which claim to be the gift of prophecy by the work of the spirit and hold fast that which is good, rejecting, of course, all manifestations which are false and bad as we see them illustrated in Mormonism and modern spiritualism because these, although they show marks of the pre Natural, all lead away from God in the Bible and thus reveal their true character. Deuteronomy 3, 13, 1 to 3. Number three, this question struck us as, a bit, as betraying quite a misapprehension of the subject of the gifts. Spiritual gifts do not appeal to the evidence of miracles in their support. For One of the gifts themselves is the working of miracles. In other words, the gifts are their own evidence. Suppose one has the gift of healing, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, and God works through such an one to relieve a sufferer from infirmity and disease. Would it not be a strange demand for someone then to ask him to work a miracle to prove that he had healed the person? The healing will he, will he, the healing will be its own evidence. So, when one claims to have had revelation through the Spirit of God, the working of a miracle will not establish his claims, for there are false miracles, but we must judge of it by other evidences. We do not find that either Daniel or John ever worked a miracle to prove that any vision which they claimed to have was genuine. In the case of the gift of prophecy, we look first at the character and position of the one who makes the claim, Secondly, at the tendency of what is taught, that is whether it leads to truth and purity and the cultivation of the heavenly graces or away from these things and away from God. And thirdly, whether there is anything in what is already revealed or in facts themselves to contradict what is set forth. And if in all this respect it bears the test, then we believe it is to be received. The Foregoing statement based on the Bible is so convinced that it cannot be overthrown. Now, after years have passed by, however, not only do we have the scriptural arguments in favor of the prophetic gift, but we have seen the footage of that work in nearly all the world and applying the scripture by their fruit you shall know them. We are convinced that the work of Miss White was of the Lord. For Seventh-day Adventists, this question is one of decisive importance. If the claim of Seventh-day Adventists that Miss White is a messenger from the Lord is true, then it follows that the Adventist church is the people of God through whom he is giving his message to mankind. If, on the other hand, the claim is false, then the Seventh-day Adventist church cannot be a remnant church spoken of in the Bible, but is a church greatly deceived. And why will um, Christian Lewis say such a statement? It is because in Revelation chapter 14, we are told here they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, which we believe, according to Revelation 19, is the gift of prophecy. It uh, may also be of interest to know how the early preachers in their debates defended their faith in this gift. In this gift. S.N. Haskell, one of the veterans of this course and a godly, broad-minded Bible student and advocate of the spirit of prophecy among Seventh-day Adventists, told how he and others met the opposition of various denominations, especially the so-called First-day Adventists, to the spirit of prophecy. As an old war horse, he loved to tell us how they presented the following proposition. One, we affirm that Seventh-day Adventists accept the testimonies as from the Lord because both in spirit and in teaching they are in complete harmony with the Bible. Two, we also affirm that if there is any doctrine or moral teaching in the testimonies in addition to what is in the Bible or contrary to the Bible, we will reject them as you do. Very amazing and very good. Three, we further submit that if the testimonies have nothing contrary to the Bible or any moral teaching additional to the Bible, and if in teaching and spirit they agree perfectly with the Bible, 
then you must either reject the Bible when you reject the testimonies or you must believe the testimonies when you believe the Bible. Now, somebody will read the statement by S.N. Haskell and say, that is what exactly what you are saying, that you are making the belief in the writings of Missy White a test of fellowship. Yet, we should not conclude A is equals B because A is equals to B, then B is equals to A. That is not what is there. And we were told that uh, by themselves that uh, the people who are coming to faith, they are not to be tested by these things because they have never had an experience in them. But people who have had uh, enough time to go through these writings, when they rise against them and enter in a work to uh, 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 sow discord and spread misinformation and they purport to be church members, then they should be dealt with, they should be counseled with, and uh, their position should be stated so that it may be seen if it, it is defensible or if it's not uh, defensible. Um, we read on, Elder Haskell stated that he had never found anyone who was willing to challenge him on this fair proposition because they were all unable to point to a single thing in the spirit of prophecy that was out of harmony with the word of God. Now, those were the days. And sometimes we wish that these pioneers were here to answer some of these naysayers on this issue. But that means we don't believe we ourselves to be studying so we cannot defend it. I pray that um, we may reach to a point we may be uh, strong enough to say that uh, let anyone who have a word against these testimonies come out and speak against them uh, and defend that. This proposition used by the veterans of the Adventist Church still hold on. Amen. Even though we believe in the prophetic gift of Miss White, we are always willing at any time to submit that gift to the test of the Holy Scriptures. The spirit of prophecy among us stands or falls on its relation to the word of God. As long as no one can point to a single thing in the spirit of prophecy that is out of harmony with the word of God, it must be admitted that it is impossible to believe in the Bible and not believe the testimonies which are in the harmony, in harmony with the Bible. At this point, we wish to call attention to a compelling fact that must not be forgotten. There are special periods in the history of God's work on earth when a large number of divine prophecies meet their fulfillment. The return of Israel from Babylonian captivity was such a time of prophetic fulfillment and the days of John the Baptist and the early apostolic church were others. But notice with care that when we come to one of those periods in which many Bible predictions meet their fulfillment, it is God's plan that there should be a living prophet to help explain the writings of former prophets. Daniel in Babylon expounded the prophecies of Jeremiah in regard to the return of Israel from Babylon, Daniel 9.14. There were many living prophets in the early days of the Christian era who set forth and expounded the writings of the former prophets. Of this, we should mention John the Baptist, the apostles, and especially Christ. In the synagogue in Nazareth, soon after his baptism, Christ, reading from the prophets of Isaiah, says, said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, Luke 4, 21. And the apostle Peter and his great sermon at the Pentecost declared, this is what which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2.16. Now, you noticed previously we read a lot of what E.G. White had to say, and now we are reading about what, what Christian Lewis has to say and quoting different pioneers and authors. Prophetic messenger, messengers are rare, especially in our day. People, infallibility, precludes the prophetic gift and so do the Protestant creeds to a large extent. What Jeremiah had, other prophets were to Israel before the Babylonian captivity and what Ezekiel meant to the people of God during the captivity, the message of the Lord and the spirit of prophecy have been and are to the Adventist people. As the prophet Ezekiel encouraged, warned and reproved the people of God and thus prepared them for the return to the Holy Land, so the spirit of prophecy has been used of God to prepare his people for the second advent. Beyond all question, the message of the Lord in the Adventist church belongs especially to that church from its beginning to the end of this age. A few stress at times the difference between those who had uh, experienced through personal acquaintance with Miss White and those who had experiences only with the messages she left. 
I happen to belong to both periods, and it is my settled conviction that the spirit today than they were while the Lord's servant was still with us. I happen to belong to the both periods, and it is my settled conviction that the spirit today than they were while the Lord's servant was still with us. Those who have never had the privilege of seeing or hearing and knowing the messenger have the same chance to test and apply the messages of the spirit of prophecy as had the early believers in Adventist church. The church today has the messages of the spirit of prophecy just as surely it had this instruction while the messenger of the Lord was living. Sometimes people claim that the Adventist church no longer has the testimony of Jesus, that is, the spirit of prophecy, because the messenger is dead. That is a most superficial assertion. We have these messages as much today as we ever he did. The personal counsel of Miss White was always helpful, but to think that the people in the early days of the church while she was living had great advantages over us as teachers or ministers in later years is a decided mistake. The value of these prophetic messages does not depend on a living person, but on the faithfulness which they are studied and followed. These messages from the Lord are just as true when the messenger is dead as they were when she was alive. And so, though I could easily have done so, I never sought an interview with Miss White. Sometimes interviewers reported her as saying what she never said. Then, too, she herself never encouraged people to go to her. She wrote, In the vision given me June 12, 1868, I was shown the danger of the people of God in looking to brother and Miss and Sister White and thinking that they must come to them with their burdens and seek counsel of them. This ought not to be, this not so, this ought not so to be. They are invited by their compassionate, loving Savior to come unto him when weary and heavy laden, and he will relieve them. In him they will find rest. When in their distress they feel the relief which is found alone in Jesus, they obtain an experience which of the highest is of the highest value to them. Testimonies, Volume 2, pages 118-119. Now, just a moment here. Many of the people who claims to have the gift today will say, bring that, go bring that person to me. The witches do that. The sorcerers do that. You go, you, you hear people say, I have somebody who can solve your problem. And then they tell you, I'm taking you to somebody. And the somebody say, I have been waiting for you for this long. And this is this, and this is that. Miss White never said, bring that person to me. She said that let the weary person go to Christ and they shall find relief. And so she was not a sorcerer. She was not a witch who could invite the people to herself. Uh, as we see, it happened today. Our early pioneers constantly urged us to read and live with the messages themselves and to make an index for our own use of the special lessons or points that we found particularly helpful and suggestive. They stressed something that is often forgotten today. That is what they call the spirit or influence of the messages. They also thought, thought that uh, the prosperity of the Advent movement in the days to come would be largely decided by our relation to this light from the Lord. And they allowed to quote the words, believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established, believe his prophets, so shall he prosper. Before the Savior left, he told his disciples, who sorrowed at the thought of his departing, that it was well for them that he went away, because taught by the Spirit of God, they would appreciate him and his teachings even more when his bodily presence was not with them. We are in a somewhat similar position today. It was a joyful experience to know Miss White, but there is a deeper, more glorious victory in believing and practicing her messages. This is one reason why Adventists today stand firm than ever before in the faith that the testimonies are of God. And this was a much reading from Lewis Harrison Christian in the fruitage of the spiritual gift. Now, as uh, I bring this to a close, I just want to add some few things uh, from James White in Advent, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Uh, dear Brother White, I am requested to write a word to you res respecting the state of general feeling in our churches as to some expression made at different times in the review from your pen, practicing respecting the visions given for the aid of the church. They feel that uh, by your expression, you have placed a less estimate upon them than the churches here have. And it has thus brought in some lack of confidence and trials in many minds. They wish you 
They wish you will take the subject into consideration. And if due to demands, make some apology through the review. That should be a relief to their minds. Many have been anxiously awaiting such an article from your pen for some time. By you are thus doing, you will relieve many an oppressed mind who feels that God's manifestation of favor are a test for his children. Now, why is uh, Brother Hiram Bingham writing this? James White had written that they do not make uh, the writings of E.G. White to be a test of fellowship for those who will enter into the church. And now here is a church saying they think that he is belittling that gift and he should write something in view of this and uh, uh, he stand that they are not a test. They, they, they think that he is doing a misfavor, a disfavor to the writings by saying that they are not a test of fellowship. And so you will always have these two extremes. One is saying you are making a test. When you say we are not making a test of them, but we believe in the Bible alone, others who have uh, lived to love them and they treat them as per the Bible will say, now you are belittling, belittling them and make a statement clarifying what you are saying. And so we are always tied between these two extremes, but uh, we are called to be temperate in all things. Even the spiritual things, we have to be temperate. You can be a spiritual person until you are just a fanatic of, uh, of, of, of being a, a spiritual person. We have seen people who have said that they have been converted and there is no reason for going in the garden anymore. Why? Because what the Lord has just told them is to study the Bible and walk around. I say walk around because at most of the time you'll find that their walking around has not helped in anything. And so you can be so spiritual minded and if there's nothing else you can do, your mind is diverted to the real life issues. As you are doing that, you need to eat and you are not eating a food that you have uh, worked for because you are so spiritual until you cannot go to the garden. Some have said they are so spiritual until they cannot do anything in the house. All that they do is read. There are others who say they have been called to be evangelists and they cannot labor in any way. And you, you, you ask a brother, hold on a minute. Between you and Paul, who, who is the evangelist here? That we have seen the fruit of his works. By the way, you are just saying you are a, an evangelist. But then we haven't seen what you have done. So can you tell me between you and uh, Paul, who is an evangelist? Can we have some facts about this? And uh, many who really understand what is being said will try to dodge, but uh, others will be caught up and they'll say it is Paul. And then you go ahead and ask them, brother, tell me, this Paul who is the greatest evangelist, what did he do for a living? Did he depend on tithes and offering? Do you know what he did? He was ten making. And you'll get them off guard by that. And some seem not um, really interested in that or uh, comfortable with that. What am I saying? There should never be these extremes that either this thing is this or it is this. There should be a balance. I'm not saying that we stay in the middle of the road. There is nothing like the middle of the road. We only have two roads. The narrow one to heaven and the broad one to hell. But at the same time, there is what is all the balance and temperance in everything. Being balanced and temperate in everything does not mean you are sitting on the fence or you are taking a neutral position. And so here we have people who say, okay, you are saying they are not a taste of fellowship. Then you are doing, you are belittling this gift. So write something to clarify and defend what you are saying. And there are others who say uh, that actually uh, we are making them a taste of fellowship. And so uh, let us see what happens in this scenario. Note, I gladly embrace this opportunity to express my views on this matter. And this is what James White is now answering Hiram Bingham. Hoping it will relieve the minds of the brethren in Vermont and elsewhere, I should have 
uh, spoken out on this subject before, but I suppose the fact being known that I was in union with the address of the conference published in number 10 and my relation to the instrument of the Lord's choice were a sufficient excuse for my silence. He's saying he don't want to fall in the trap of nepotism, nepotism, where actually you are told, you know, you are supporting this because either this is your wife, this is your brother, or this is your sister. I want to stay clear out of these things and let the church of God be the one to test what is coming from my wife. Let me not be the propon proponent of uh, what kind of spiritual gift that she's having. So he says, I wanted to stay out of this, either supporting or not supporting these things. He says, my position has been one of trial. Why? Because he's the husband to the purported messenger or the true messenger. The relations I have sustained to the work in the rise and progress of the course of present truth have exposed me to a thousand thrust from those who are opposed to the work. Elder James continues to say, I have been, I have ever been slow to speak of Miss White Vision in a public manner, but in consequence of the almost utter silence of those who should have spoken fit words in season, I have felt almost com I have felt compelled to speak. And if I have spoken in a manner that has given the idea that I lightly esteemed them, when he said that I, we as a church do not make a test of them, it has not resulted from an unwillingness to bear the cross of Christ. It has been in reference to the welfare of the cause that I have spoken and acted, notwithstanding all my errors. In regard to the visions being a test, I confess that I have spoken without fully expressing myself and if brother b had pointed out the expression he merely refers to i should now be able to give a more definite reply and so you find that james white is caught up in uh addressing the issue if he supports the uh, visions uh to be a, a taste of fellowship or not and if he is not supporting them to be a taste of fellowship then he is belittling them and so this is a husband of the messenger and all this is coming to him and it feels like a pressure. And so it is well known that we have been charged with testing all men by the visions and of making them the rule of our faith. This is a bold and truth of which those who uttered it were not ignorant. This I have denied and deny it still, but there is need to be so much blindfold blindfold stumbling over this matter, to say unqualified, unqualifiedly that they are a test and carry out the principle with those who know nothing of their teachings, spirit and fruit, at this time when the world is fully of manifestations as near the genuine as certain can get, will be the wildest fanatism. On the other hand, for those who profess to believe them, to say they will in no wise be tested by them is most irrational. I still say that the Bible is my rule of faith and practice, and in saying this, I do not reject the Holy Spirit in its diversities of operations. If any refer to an expression in a published extract of a letter written to a brother in the West, I will say that that related to those who know but little of the vision saved by false re reports. I believe them to be the property of the church and attest to those who believe them from heaven. Let those who regard it as their duty speak out as to their character, spirit, and influence, while silence will be better become me in regard to them. As to the perpetuity of the gifts, I shall speak as God gives me a trend. James White. And so um, this is James White now being called to defend himself why he doesn't believe that uh, the testimonies are a test of fellowship. And he repeats the same thing, that it will be an uttermost fanatism to say that these things are a test to anyone who has never read them, anyone who have never experienced them, and anyone even who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. He says that is the greatest fanatism that we can ever have as a people when we have a lot of false prophecies, prophets teeming among us. He says, let those who have come to church experience these writings, seeing the fruitage of the Spirit, uh, uh, decide on them. And 
he says it will be irrational for those who have had enough time to read them to say that they cannot be tested with them because they have also to say if the, the visions are false or if they are true. And if they say they are false, those who have been in charge for many years and have read these things, if they are false, then let them point to these things so that the brethren may be able to come together and study them. And those who are saying these things are true, they have to sit down with the brethren and show them how they feel these things are true. So to those who don't know anything about the visions, the experiences, and they are not church members, they cannot be tested by these things. For those who have been in the church for years, and some have even seen her in a vision and have had an experience of the lifestyle of the messenger or the carrier of these messages, then they have no excuse of not being tested by them. Because how will you sit there saying that this is the church of God while you have somebody in that church who is one of um, the pioneers of that church speaking false things and you are there supporting that church with your type, supporting them with their evangelistic campaigns, while you believe the same person who is one of those people is a false prophetess. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. So after you have been there for many years, you have had an experience, you have either seen the person in a vision, then you can be tested by this vision, or you can test this vision and give an account or give a report if they are true or false. This is what essentially James White is speaking. But he says for him, he stand no chance to be judged by the people on what he believes on the testimonies because he believes it's a manifestation. Yet it is not a test for some class of people because that will be fanatism. And it is a test for some because it will be irrational again for them to remain silent on them but he is not the right person to speak about the thing because this will be actually either discrediting uh his own wife or supporting his own wife which actually uh it will be a bias you 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 can uh, you know even in the court of justice i don't know you, you can't call my own wife to defend me that i'm not a thief you will have to call the people who have interacted with me apart from my wife and be able to find my wife should be the last person to give evidence that this person is so and so. Because what if she says that and all the other people are saying this person is so and so. So the weight of evidence is carried, but the last person to give the weight of evidence is the person who is related to you such close. And so this one, James White say, excuse me, this is my position. She is not a test to the people who are new and who doesn't know anything about her. That is fanatism. But it is irrational, again, to say that it can be a test for those who have been amongst us, experienced these things and seen these things. But it is not for me to write up something to defend them because she is my wife. Um, and so uh, Christian Lewis says, God has a particular object in placing these spiritual gifts in the church. They are to preserve his people from fanatism and error and to correct wrongs and expose sin. Through the Bible, the Lord uses the gifts as means by which he teaches his people when they are in danger of taking a wrong step. By them, the Spirit of God sheds lights upon church difficulties and helps to adjust things that otherwise would be impossible. The spiritual gifts cause light to shine upon his people when they are in danger of going astray. The Spirit brings in unity and preserves God's children from strife and division. In one word, we may say the purpose of the spiritual gifts is to keep the people of God in the faith so that they may be of one mind and one judgment concerning the scriptures. Human discernment alone cannot search out hidden iniquity or adjust dark and complicated situations or preserve from error. Many churches have adopted creeds to help them preserve the faith. God's plan is that instead of creed, the church should have the divine gifts, not gift, gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, and thus prevent this conflicting interpretation of the scriptures. It would be sad indeed if God could not at this late and dangerous day converse with his people. To the foregoing, however, we will add that the gift of the Spirit belong primarily to the household of faith. The Seventh-day Adventists claim to have the gift of the Spirit in their church. 
especially the spirit of prophecy. But we recognize that God's children should not test the world in any manner by demanding a belief in spiritual gifts, nor do we in our intercourse with various religious parties who are striving to walk in the spirit of God make this gift a test of Christian character. We do not urge upon non-members and an acceptance of this manifestation of the spirit of God, nor do we test them by their teaching. Come meeting in the western states were to be held in Missouri, uh, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, beginning in late May and running to early July. James White announced that he and Ellen White planned to attend some of them in Review and Herald, May 23, 1871. They began their work with a Iowa meeting at Knoxville. Attendance was good, but they, they learned from Conrad and Little John of these divisive attitudes of a number who attended the Missouri meeting. As the result of the deceptive work of Mr. Of Mr. Good Enough and Mr. Carver, quite a group opposed Ellen White and the visions. James White, as he wrote of the uh, situation, pointed out that Seventh day Adventists believe that the spirit of prophecy has rested on Miss White and that she is called to do a special work at this time among these people. He pointed out in 2 Biography 3.20.3. .3, they do not, however, make a belief in this work a test of Christian fellowship. But after men and women have had evidence that the work is of God and then join hands with those who fight against it, our people claim the right to separate from such that they may enjoy their sentiments in peace and in quiet. And so that is it. And you have it until that point. And I think that issue is so clear. Those who feel that uh, they are not accepting it, let them have their way, but let them not come and cause actually uh, a discord and a strife amongst those who believe them. Now, I, I don't think that uh, it will be well to be born in a family or to say that you want to be part of a, a certain family and then start opposing what is believed in that family and the principles of that family. Just exclude yourself from that family. That is the simplest thing you can do. And so he said that the gifts are for that household. But if you think that uh, this is not right, then don't belong to that household. That is the simplest thing that uh, it can be said. And that is what they are saying. Otherwise, may the Lord continue blessing us. And uh, we thank him for holding up the reins until this has been completed. May you continue praying for the church at general. But more so, let us continue praying for our lives individually because we shall not be tested as a church and as a group. We want to have a vantage ground on our Bibles, what we believe, and be able to defend it. And that is what Miss White was saying. Never quote me until you are on the vantage ground with the Bible. That is what we want. We want the Spirit of God to work amongst us in a mighty way. We don't want to be a one-gift church. We have that churches in this world which are just a miracle working church nothing else no bible studies nothing else people go for miracles from morning to evening we have just a church which is called the house of prayer nothing happens there people pray from morning to evening and speak in tongues that is what they are let us not be found saying that we are a church of the gift of prophecy and that is that is sister white's writings that, that that thing is even greater than we ever thought about the gift of prophecy cannot work in the church if we do not other gifts in the church because who will be able to prove this gift we have people who have the gifts uh the gift of apostles the gift of teachers we have the gift of interpretation the gift of understanding the prophecies it, it, we don't just need people seeing visions and giving the church we need people who can start those visions and tell the church what is the truth. And so the gift of prophecy cannot work as a standalone gift in any given church on this world. Never, not even Seventh-day Adventists. We have not one gift in this church. We have people who are teachers and they can examine what is being said and see if it's truth or false. We have people who can interpret things in their rightful context and the background of what we are speaking about. We have people whom God have given the gift of tongues, not glossolalia as people think about it, but the true gift of tongues. 
people who have never learned a language, but within a space of one week, they can speak a language that is comprehensible. We have people who are apostles, people who have been sent, and their work has been seen. And we have the people who have uh, uh, the gift of evangelism, and they have won people to Christ. And we have seen these fruits manifested among us. The only wrong path and the wrong thing that many are taking is to take one gift in the church and make it everything instead of getting the totality of everything. Otherwise, with those many remarks, may we be blessed and uh, God be praised as we continue in this series of the prophets. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Our good Lord in heaven, thank you for Jesus in whom all uh, blessings flow through. We see the blessings of the literal rain and the spiritual rain. And we see the Lord, you want to do something special to your church in this end time. Not only manifesting uh, yourself in one gift, but in all gifts. For you say that these gifts are for the church until the end of the time. We believe that as it was prophesied in Joel, it is happening among us. And uh, Lord, you will uh, bring us to a height and the stature of the man Jesus Christ that we may not be tossed about with winds of doctrines. And so be magnified. Lord, let us decrease as you increase daily in our lives. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. And so may our good Lord bless us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings until we meet again.